It is your pal Archie Gamble here, coming at you for the third time in as many days. I've been inspired, and I don't normally do these rambles unless I have an inspiration and reason to do them. I know, in other words, meaning I don't do them, you know, every week or ever. You know, there's no set schedule for me to do them. I just do them when I feel like I have something to talk about. And actually, today is Friday, July 19th, 2024. And this week, uh, 30 years ago this week, uh, Sunday, July 17th, um, 1994, I appeared and performed at the Detroit Fan Kiss Convention, which Peter Chris was the featured guest at. I performed there with a live. But that's not what makes this particular fan expo so notorious and i use the terminology fan expo because shortly after this kiss did a series of of official expos as we know or conventions so this one was one of the last ones before they took the bull by the horns and, and did their own i think frankly that was well we'll get to that in a second but the big the big draw and the big thing the big uh, to do about this particular convention was Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley appeared with a lawyer and some state troopers, came in through a side door and started reclaiming costume pieces, guitars, things that have belonged to them, still belong to them, and had gone missing from the Kiss Warehouse in New York City over the years. So this is where it gets interesting. You know, a whole bunch of stuff to tell if you're a Kiss fan, buckle up for this one, because it's a good one. So basically, A, I was there as a performer, B, I was there as a KISS fan, and C, this is the cool part, I happened to be standing right at a table that was 10 feet away, maybe 15 feet away from where Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley slid in this, through the side door. Now you gotta remember something here. They weren't scheduled to appear. Peter Chris was paid and scheduled to appear. Well, not perform. He wouldn't sit in with us, but whatever. He never does. So, imagine my surprise and the surprise of everyone around me when three quarters of the original Kiss are in the same building unexpectedly. And I honestly had to do a double take. I thought maybe it was a couple of guys. At these conventions, you'll often get not just people to dress up like Kiss in costumes and, and makeup and walk around. Uh, you'll also get people that look like dress like the kiss in their real day-to-day -day lives they're such big fans that they they take after paul stanley or gene fashion wise so first glance i kind of thought that's what it was and then i went holy shit it's gene and paul they just stuck it through you know that it was in a hotel um matter of fact maybe once you get some facts in before we get so deep into this i, I brought my ipad to, to consult for facts because it wants to be correct so yeah as i said it was uh july 17th and, uh, you know, so 1994, 30 years ago this week, 30 years, Jesus Christ. I'm trying to remember what hotel it was at. Um, it was at a hotel ballroom. You know, fans would rent these rooms and have uh, fan conventions. And uh, it was pretty cool, like, um, you know, I attended a lot of them, played a lot of them too with a live. I was at a Kiss tribute band called Live, by the way. I'll put a picture here. So this one, uh, I, I haven't really got it. The, I get the name of the hotel. Oh, actually, I know exactly where I can get it from. Yeah, I've got it here. I've got a flyer for the event. I forgot that I had that, which I will actually insert here. Uh, when I get it, I will put it on the screen for you to see and i will put it on the screen right now so it's the first annual detroit kiss convention sunday july 17th 1994 10 a.m to 7 p.m at the northfield hilton so as you can see there on the flyer it also tells that peter chris is a special guest Tables of worldwide Kiss dealers, all day Kiss video, world premiere of a, of a video, Kiss Museum, and Kiss Alive. We weren't called the Kiss Alive, we were called Alive, but performance by Alive tribute band with us. 
So, I'm thinking to the meat of this thing. I don't know if you are a Kiss fan, a rabid one or other was, or have anyone in your life who is a rabid Kiss fan, but they are not, and I mean that in the most affectionate, sweet way possible. They have the greatest collections of memorabilia. There's literally people that keep styrofoam cups that have the remains of the blood, the stage blood that Gene Simmons uses. So the roadie will make it up in the, in the uh, late the evening before the show, a concoction of you know food coloring and stage blood and eggs and yogurt and stuff to thicken it up. And they'll go over and bag for set lists and the stage blood and so they keep everything. Matter of fact, there was rumored to be a woman that slept with Gene back in the 70s and she took his uh, man sauce and she froze it in a, in a vial. That story's been going around for Kiss, Kiss circles for years. So, as you can see, they're wild Kiss fans and they collect stuff. And then there's people that goes all the way up to you, not just people getting set lists and taking stubs and passes at concerts. There are people that buy costume pieces from the original days, like guitars. Kiss caught on to this, of course. I never made the correlation until now, but in the last few tours, they were selling stage used guitars, stage used microphones. I think they learned a lesson from these conventions, seeing that how this stuff had been stolen and sold out the back door, which we'll get to. So there was a demand for it, because they're selling these guitars for like $20,000. They're beautiful guitars, the Paul Stanley Iceman that Paul had played through the show, Purple Sparkle, beautifully set up guitar. And he would sign up for you, you got to meet him backstage, you got the you know guitar in the case and the strap. Oh, sorry, the strap is extra. That's actually a true story. You want the strap, you have to pay more. Jesus Christ. So, yeah, imagine a, a, an entire convention center full of these people, right? And I'm in one of them. I'm one of you, if you're a kid fan watching. So imagine standing there, and all of a sudden, the door's open. Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley walk in, and this is long after the original kiss broke up, and Peter Chris is upstairs in, in a dressing room or a hotel room getting ready. Three or four members of the original band together in, the, in a building for the first time in probably decades. Pretty wild. So the like, ripple went through the crowd like you wouldn't believe. And I ran over to the Alive guys who were up in the next room, up on stage, doing last minute stuff, preparing for the show. I had already set up and I was looking through some of the booths. I was like, guys, Gina Paula here. And they're like, aren't you fuck off? I said, listen to me. Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley, the real ones just walked in. Just follow me quick. And I think they could hear in the tone of my voice that it was real. So they followed me back over to the other room and sure enough, they're there. We're all gobsmacked. And of course they were swarmed by fans asking fan questions. Because Kiss fans are more hardcore than even Trekkies, right? They want to know the most excruciating minutiae you've ever heard of. But what they did, I give them credit for this. Like most things Gene and Paul do, very business-like. They thought it up beforehand. They came in through a side door right by the displays and started right away at the first table, kept walking rapidly. They would point the stuff. The state troopers would take the pieces and put them in cardboard cartons. And the lawyer would present the person with a, with a piece of, you know, a legal form saying that the stuff was being confiscated, okay? And they went from table to table and just kept moving. Well, try to, hi, how you doing? Say hi to fans, I'll stop them for autographs and stuff. So we'll talk after. And they kept walking, went through every display. And you could hear people losing their minds, like collectors that had paid thousands of dollars for costume pieces. Going, what the fuck is this? I bought this on eBay. Well, I don't know if eBay existed back then, but I bought this from, you know, the collector's underground circuit and stuff. This is bullshit. And the lawyer and the cop saying, if we can find out, if we can, you know, if we can legally prove that it's yours legally, you'll get it back. Okay, so they walked, sweep through the whole building quickly, efficiently, filled up cardboard cartons. And then Gina Paul came over to our main room on our stage. They were standing right, by our, right in front of our gear. I wish I had a picture of it. Um, and proceeded to talk to the crowd about why they were there. And I'll tell you what, I'm gonna insert a video clip from Detroit Area News right here that will explain it far better than I ever can. Well, two members of the colorful rock group KISS went to court today in Detroit to get the boot, literally. Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley, two original members of KISS. And this poster we're going to show you may jog your memory of the costumes they used to wear in the late 70s and 80s. Well, some of those costumes and some wild boots disappeared from a warehouse a couple years ago. 
yesterday they turned up at a KISS convention in Troy. We were very careful in uh, identifying the people who we believed literally took it or received stolen goods and we basically just went in and got them. When something is important to you, whether it's a photo album or something that, that is near and dear to you from your past, it's rightfully yours, and to see someone else have it and making money off it is really unfair. In that temporary Oakland Circus Judge Gene Snells ordered the costumes returned to KISS. Nevertheless, the band members promised that they have no intention of dressing like this on their upcoming tour. Hey y'all, I'm interrupting this video to insert some footage that I just found. It's 10 to 3 in the morning, you see in my, my bathrobe. I was watching footage of the Detroit Convention after I had filmed and edited the vlog about the Detroit Convention, and somebody posted some of their uh, Hi8 or um, VHS footage from 1994, and there I am on stage shaking hands with Gene while Gene and Paul are talking to the audience. So we're in the middle of this vlog while you're watching it right now. I'm going to re-edit it, post this in, so you can see the footage of me that day with Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley at the show, right? Hey, Paul! Oh, yeah! Hey! Gene Simmons! Gene Simmons! Gene look back at this with 30 years of hindsight and realize exactly what had happened and I do know to this day now what has happened it's come out in several uh, KISS books and other sources it turns out that the KISS's former manager Bill O'Coin who had brought them to the heights in the 70s had become uh, in the late 70s early 80s he wanted to manage Billy Idol after KISS but he became a, a free base crack addict and just smoked his entire fortune away, which is a shame, but addiction, you know, no judgment here. Addiction can hit the rich, the poor, everyone. And uh, not only that, but when he lost his money, he started selling stuff from the Kiss Warehouse out in the back door. So that's how all these incredible pieces got uh, out into, into circulation. So Gene and Paul were in the right. They had a court order, an injunction, or whatever you call it, as you can see from the clip which you showed. And um, they had every right to be there. I don't know that necessarily went about it the right way. And rumor has it they did, either later that day or the next day, some of the pieces were returned to the rightful owners, I was told. People that could prove through, maybe they bought from Ace Fraley, because that's another thing. Peter Chris and Ace Fraley left Kiss when they hit hard times, pun intended. Um, they sold off personal items that they own, of their own costumes and whatnot. As a matter of fact, a guy I know, uh, Steve Campbell of Mississauga, owned Peter Chris's Love Gun, a live two drum kit, Dynasty 2. It's a black, uh, black, it's actually a black and gold racing stripes. People don't realize that. Chrome finished kit. He bought it. I think for, I think I already paid $10,000 for it in the, in the, in like around 90 or 89 or something. And now that he sold it to the Hard Rock Cafe and it's uh, hanging up somewhere in Asia or something, I believe, or Mexico. So I digress a little bit, as I tend to do. Sometimes I digress. How about you? And uh, yeah, it was a wild scene, man. Like this, Those conventions were really fun, by the way. They were really fun to play and really fun to attend. Because you could buy rare bootleg videos before there was the internet. Um, you know, stuff you would have killed to see as a kid, right? Like. The Rock and Roll Over Tour, a rare, a rare footage of the first Kiss Tour, the, you know, black and white footage of them playing live. It's just great, great stuff, live recordings, and you know, cool fan-made t-shirts. And... So yeah, it was really cool. Now here's another part of this. As I said, we did perform with this, and Peter Chris was there as a hired guest, hired to speak and sign autographs, okay? Well, when he heard Gina Paul there, he, I remember hearing from the promoter right when it happened, he lost his mind. Peter's an angry guy to begin with. And, uh, he was, there, we were told that he said, what? But when she, we heard Gina Paul were collecting pieces, he said, what's with these fucking guys? Do they sleep with this stuff or what? Which was pretty funny. 
So he was pretty angry. He thought that they had upstaged him and stole stole his thunder, which has been a common complaint of Peter's for decades, not realizing, of course, that they actually gave him thunder and, and a career in the first place, but that's a whole other vlog. I uh, love you, Peter. I do. So, yeah, you know, so uh, all the brouhaha calmed down, and Gene and Paul were wise enough to leave. They got on stage and spoke a little bit, explained their side of the story. They got some booze, but they left. And I thought they handled it as well as it could be handled. It's a very delicate situation. And then, uh, we played outside. I thought it was, sorry. Gina Paul didn't speak in front of her again. I think we were originally supposed to play inside. That's what it was, but then it got changed to outside. So I have to correct my mistake of that. I was convincing, uh, confusing it with um, the uh, New York City Kiss Convention where Ace Fraley had sat up and talked in front of our equipment. That's what it was. Forgive me. So we went out and played outside and Peter Chris was watching from the balcony of his hotel room, we could see him. And we asked him over the mic to get up and play, and he, he said no. We asked him twice, and he said no both times. So, he got to see a live play. And then afterwards, we of course wanted to meet him. So the promoter arranged for us to come down to the, the bar and the, la the lounge in the hotel, and there was Peter. And we were still in costume, we'd just come off stage, and I'll put a picture in here of us with Peter Griff. And uh, it was decent enough, you know, just like, posed for a shot and sat down at a table and talked to him. And I'll never forget this. The CD jukebox, remember those? In the bar. Somebody put on Beth, thinking to appease Peter or whatever, but it turned out to be the Smash of Trashes and Hits re-recording of Beth that featured Eric Carr on vocals. And as soon as the fan realized it, he ran across the bar, I'll never forget this, and unplugged it, because he didn't want to offend Peter. And Peter turned around to him and goes, what did you do that for? I've never heard that before. I want to hear it. Which was funny. The guy was all red in the face. So, we're sitting there talking to Peter. Here's a personal story. I'm talking to Peter. And these things, the fans, uh, one thing I have to say about Kiss fans sometimes, as great as they are, they get so excited that revert to 10-year-old kids and their manners go out the window. So they interrupt a meal, they'll interrupt a conversation. It's happened multiple times. So I sit talking to Peter and asking some drum questions and stuff. We're talking about the song Detroit Rock City and one of these fans barrels in and goes, you were playing it wrong. And I looked at him and I'm like, I'm talking to one of my drum heroes, but he's like, fuck off, I wanted to say I didn't. And uh, so Peter goes, yeah, he goes, we, you know, there's no double bass in that song. I don't play double bass at the time especially. I said, no, no, I have a double bass player. He goes, oh, you only play single bass. I said, yeah, he goes, Oh, what it was was, and I, and I stand by this, Peter at the time was not a playing drummer. I was playing the Alive 2 version, which is, we were playing the Alive 2 version, which is much more up-tempo and a busier kick drum pattern. Peter nailed it on Alive 2, by the way. And I said, no, I played the Alive 2 version. He went, oh, okay. And I could see the wheels turning in his head that maybe he was wrong. Double bass, I don't play double bass, so... Anyway, other than that, I have to admit, it was a, a pleasant experience chatting with Peter. A lot of the times, it can be not so um, pleasant, if I'm being honest. So now that I've told my basic story and memories of the day, it was pretty cool, pretty cool day all around. And of course, Gina Paul came in, went to, they, I was told they flew in from LA, went to court that morning, got the papers, as you can see in the video from the news, went straight to the, to the convention, did their thing in one swoop, went up to the stage and talked, and then went out the same side doors. And I was told they went straight to the airport and left. I don't know if that's true. But I tell you what we got here. We got Kiss FAQ, Kiss FAQ, get it? Dot com, which is a source known for being one of the most informative for, for Kiss um, fans to, to vlog, blog, and chat on and ask questions. So, Here's someone asking about the convention rate, and here's various facts that we can share with you. I said, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, there's no podcast about this. Well, I'll post my link here. These people can watch mine. So, uh, there we go. Oh, I have one. 
My wife at the time hooked us up for this convention. Spiro's tribute band allowed to play in the parking lot behind the hotel. I shot video of the convention, the band, and the raid. I remember milling around the inside of the bar and looking at a dealer port and darted into an airport, into an airport bathroom. And you know, I remember hearing about this now after it's back. As a matter of fact, this was, might have been the catalyst for the reunion. One of them. Because I do remember saying to the guys in my band, you know, when Gina Paul see how popular these things are, they're going to realize that the fans want, uh, you know, the original thing again. Because they were at the lowest. After Revenge, everything started tanking, and they couldn't, you know, they were playing clubs and shit. And then they did their own convention tour, and I'm, I'm convinced to this day when they saw the success of the Detroit thing, they saw this money being made, they said, hey, why don't we do it? And I'm going to add this, on that convention tour, I told my bandmates multiple times, I said, you watch, after this, Kiss is going to reunite, put makeup and costumes back on. And remember, Spiro in particular going, bullshit, they hate each other. I said, Spiro, what's going to happen? I know enough about the music business to tell you this. If they're holding these conventions and they're not able to sell out arenas anymore, there's nowhere to go but up from here. They can't go, they've hit bottom. No, respectfully speaking. And they know what the fans want. They're going to do it. When they're taking out a convention tour of the past, for costumes, stage props, instruments, you know that that's going to happen. And sure enough, at the end, the very end of that tour, a couple weeks after, they filmed the Unplug with Ace and Peter, right? And then they announced the reunion. I was right. So, I mean... The fans spoke, and Gina and Paul were smart. They saw what people wanted, right? And then, and yeah, I forgot about that, that they saw Peter at the airport and talked a little bit. I remember hearing about that, actually. Yeah. So here's, a, here's an interesting thing. This guy that posted here says, he was sandwiched between Gene and Paul as they walked to the stage. People were grabbing from all directions, and Paul kept saying over and over again to the cops, lawyers, and Gene in a smooth voice, just keep walking, just keep walking. Which is true, I witnessed that. that's exactly what they did. So, yeah, I see some of this stuff, if there's anything that's interesting sharing here. So yeah, oh, here's an interesting angle. I forgot about that. And actually, here's what's funny on Kiss, Kiss Fuck You. I found a post I made years ago about this. Because they still post on here and talk with Kiss fans. Here's another perspective on this. This is getting, we're deep diving here, folks. So, initially, Bill Aquine, after the fact, before it tragically passed away, he came forward and told his side of the story. And he admitted that, yeah, he was selling stuff from the warehouse. But here's a tidbit Kiss haven't told people. I don't know how to believe this, if I believe it. But this is, this is Bill Coyne, the former manager's side of the story. He said that he offered Gina Paul to buy back the warehouse full of stuff. Because he was the one that had his, it was his name on the warehouse. He was paying the rent on it and had all this stuff. And Gina Paul re relocated late 80s, early 90s to LA. And he was in Europe with all this stuff. He said, look, I got a warehouse full of stuff. I can't afford to keep paying for this warehouse. And he said that they told him to keep it. So this is a, this is a, a clash of the Titans afterwards. Gina Paul are saying, bullshit, it was stolen. So I have to see, I actually should have read this before I started this. But I'm actually kind of glad we're doing it this way because you can go through this with me in real time. So yeah, uh, they did offer, according to him, he offered it, Gina Paul, they said no, so he sold it. So, and another, and again, another reiterating that Ace Frehley and Peter Chris themselves sold some fans pieces from their homes or their garages and their basement from their storage. And I was led to believe that, like if you bought something out of a receipt from Ace Frehley or whatever, you got it back from Gina Paul. That's what I was told. Maybe they're just talking up here good guys. I don't know. But isn't it funny though, a couple years later, a year later, they did their own convention tour with the very pieces they took back? Gina Paul, if anything, they're smart. Okay. Let's look at this. Yeah. 
Yeah, so there's a guy, there's a fan, there's a fan, a super Kiss fan called Vinny Gonzalez from New York that he had followed Kiss from the club days. And they knew him, like he used to bring, you know, they, they would come to his house and uh, his mother would cook pasta for Peter and his wife. And like, he was, he was friends with the band, as much as a fan could be. And he had a huge collection of stuff, but he was given to him by, by Kiss. So that's a whole other thing, right? Um, and so it's apparently it's reading here that Vinny sold most of his collection. Gene heard about it and said, how much did he get for it? And he said, around $750,000. And Gene got really mad. <laughs> no one's allowed to make money off of Kiss except for me. That's my Gene impersonation, by the way. I know. So yeah. Let's have a little look here. This is unbelievable. You guys really, there's a lot of stuff that really deep dive into stuff here that you might not even want to, uh, you know. Get you the know, afternoon. We'd be here for hours. Kiss, I just say Kiss fans are worse than Trekkies. We, like, all the minutia, all of the minutia explored, always. So, I think we've covered enough of it though. We covered the basic gist of it. And that was Joe Marshall put on a fan organized Kiss convention. Hired Peter Chris to appear. Gene and Paul heard about it, showed up through the side door, and announced. Took back the costume pieces, caused a furor. And Peter wasn't happy about it. We performed, Peter watched, we met Peter after. Pretty fucking good day for a Kiss fan, I'll tell you that. That was one of the things about Alive that I absolutely loved. And guys, if any of you are watching, I love all three of you. And I, I, I loved our time. I miss you guys as friends, spending time with you. And I loved our run together. We had a great time. And uh, thank you for all the wonderful memories. It was fantastic. So I guess that's about it for this subject, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for putting up with me. Thanks for listening, as you always do. And uh, Kiss loves you. Rock and roll. Oh, please subscribe. Please share. Please comment. But most importantly, please subscribe.